Hey everybody, welcome to the ninth episode of Drive Through FM. Today we're going to be talking about PAX Unplugged, which I just got back from yesterday at the time of this recording. I know this is a little bit off schedule because the last uh, video thing to appear on my YouTube channel was the Necromunda interview, which is also a Drive Through FM kind of voice only thing. I figured let me go ahead and get my thoughts down now and I'll kind of eat this one up as my December podcast and then I can kind of focus on doing some reviews and things and end of year list kind of stuff like that for December because uh, I've got a little bit of a backlog of stuff that I've played and haven't reviewed. I'll talk about some of that here because uh, I did play a few things at PAX obviously and then we'll just kind of jump in now uh, just to a couple of quick things I want to talk about. And then I'm just going to leave the breadth of the episode to covering PAX, talking about the convention, comparing it to other conventions and stuff like that. And then we'll just kind of wrap it up. So it's going to be a little bit outside the norm of the, the regular format that I do on the podcast. But I just wanted to take a quick minute and mention something that folks have sort of uh, approached me about, especially at PAX Unplugged and also in emails and stuff like that is I got a lot of messages from uh, former Patreon supporters. Uh, I had a Patreon that I ran uh, earlier uh, in the year and towards the end of last year, and I ran it for a little bit, and it was doing just fine, and then I decided to cancel it. And so a lot of people said, you know, I would support you again and all that kind of stuff, and man, I completely appreciate that. I do this for fun. I do it as a hobby. I've done Kickstarters before, and that's more than alleviated some of the costs to go to stuff like Gen Con and it's helped me upgrade my equipment. I've got better cameras now, better lighting. I'm recording on a Zoom mic right now with a nice microphone and all that stuff. That stuff's been really helpful because I, you know, this is not my job. It's not even hardly a second job, although it kind of sometimes, you know, delves into that category, but I want to try to do the best thing that I can because I appreciate games and I appreciate all the work that goes into them and the love and the craft. And I want to try to put a little bit of that, you know, into my stuff that talks about them, obviously. Uh, so I've really appreciated that. And the folks that have appreciated the things that I've had to say, uh, you know, just great feedback that I've gotten. And it's really, uh, you know, just a pleasure to hear. It warms my heart and all that stuff. Uh, but the Patreon part of it, and here's the funny thing. And I've, I've wanted to kind of say this for a while. And I want to say it in a way that is not antagonistic but probably will come off a little bit like that if you take it wrong and I don't want anybody to take it wrong but for me the patreon actually started to pretty quickly force a bias in my coverage and I'm at a crossroads now with in terms of not necessarily the games I play but in terms of what I want to cover I mean if you've noticed that I've covered a lot more miniature games and stuff like that and that's not something that necessarily the patreon folks were backing me for they were kind of backing me on the strength of my former previous coverage. And I still play Euro games and regular board games and Ameritrash games and lots of card games and all the lunchtime games. I still play all that stuff. I still love all of it. But in terms of like what I want to cover even within those genre, a lot of times the voting for the Patreon to vote on which games I covered was the antithesis of what I actually wanted to cover and what I actually was able to get played and was enthusiastic about. And so it was there was a bias that was sort of creeping in there for maybe two or three months. Uh, you know, it wasn't a, a big deal. It was just a subtle thing, but it really kind of torqued me a little bit. And uh, and also I was going through this kind of transition where I was really getting into miniatures. And so it was a very difficult kind of thing where all of a sudden it, it was not uh, fun. And I found it kind of funny because I was, wasn't really able to verbalize it, uh, but... It, to me, you know, you hear a lot of people like, well, if you get a free review copy or you are kind of friendly with a publisher, that's going to skew your review of the game. And frankly, I don't think that's true for most people. And it certainly isn't true for me. I just had a conversation with the publisher at PAX Unplugged. You know, there's two games that I was going to review for them. He says, you know, how, how do those go? You get them. And then I said, yeah, do not like this one at all. And this other one I'm really liking. I need to play some more, obviously. And perfectly cool with that most publishers that i've talked to that i've you know given negative reviews or blacklisted games they're way more than understanding uh they know that not every game is going to hit with everyone even if i like a game and all stuff so it's kind of funny to me that a lot of times you get this talk about it and i think that's just uh for lack of a better word kind of ignorance of, of how it happens and stuff and i've even seen other reviewers and podcasters and stuff like that mention it but 
Yeah. So to me, actually, the more biased thing that that's really affected my work and honestly, kind of my soul with this was the Patreon. And I think that's something that I wasn't able to verbalize because I got a lot of questions like, why? What the heck? Why did you, you know, the Patreon was moving right along. It was fine. Why did you stop it? And, you know, I'm sorry it took me so long to kind of explain this publicly, but I really had to sit with it for a while and just see how how I was going. Was I going through a phase or what? You know, just kind of self-analyze. And a lot of times I think that's an uh, that's a hidden bias in terms of like, you know, doing a review or coverage of a game. It's like, what do I expect to get views? What do I expect that people will be interested in? What do they want to hear about? A lot of times you get, I'll do a review for... I don't know, let's say a Rumble Slam, which is completely unknown, and it creeped up just over a thousand views. And I, it frankly, a little bit breaks my heart because it's just an unknown game. It doesn't come up in the Google searches and not that many people are interested in it. But then I'll review another game that's, you know, it's already been reviewed a little bit or there's some buzz and then that gets like 10,000 views or whatever. Uh, you know, and I'm like, well, they're both good games, but it just is like, ah, oh, what the heck, guys? <laughs> like, this other stuff is really good. I wish you would look at the views, uh, the videos that, you know, maybe you never heard of before. So I think from my perspective, I just wanted to get, get this out of the way at the beginning of the episode, then I'll leave you alone and talk about packs. But the bias that comes in sometimes is, is a little bit more subtle than you might think. Uh, and so I just wanted to share that with you because that's, it's, a, it's a decision process of like, what do I cover? What am I going to do? What am I going to get feedback on? I mean, the views is just an, a number the thumbs up, that's a number, but what am I going to get comments on? What are people going to interact with? What are we going to talk about? Uh, so that's a, that's a real, that's a real bias. And I think that's, that's okay. It's a normal bias because people are interested in what they're interested in. Um, so anyway, all that kind of came to a head with the Patreon. And again, I really appreciate it. I just seem to get a lot of comments at PAX and even recently, like I said, via email about this. So I just wanted to cover that, get that out of the way. And then let's have a little bit of fun now uh, talking about PAX Unplugged. So I guess the first thing to talk about, and I'll just kind of walk through my progress as I made it through the days. I arrived on Thursday, the day before the con officially started. And out of character, I stayed all three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I usually leave on the Sunday for these different conventions. But I said, let me stay all the way through. It's the first time this con's happened. Uh, let me kind of see it all the way from beginning to end. And then I left on Monday. Uh, so arriving Thursday, I met my buddy Eric Tao of the Push Your Luck podcast and the Push Your Luck podcast YouTube channel, and we met up and we went to a very nice uh, ramen place. Now, right next to the Philadelphia Convention Center is uh, Chinatown, so there's a lot of great Asian food and different restaurants and all that kind of great stuff, and I'm a fan of, well, frankly, all kinds of food, but I really particularly like, uh, let's just call it Eastern or Asian food. I like Indian food, Chinese food. Japanese food, Korean food, I love all that stuff, especially if it's spicy. So we went to a ramen place. I got a really spicy uh, ramen type of thing. It was really good. Uh, just to make mention, I will be showing pictures of all the stuff I'm talking about. If you're on the YouTube watching this, you'll see this picture of kind of a weird Iron Man suit. And this was actually in the ramen restaurant. C completely just an odd thing to be in there. Just a normal kind of looking restaurant and then this giant Iron Man suit. And I was like, okay, I think I'm in the right place here because, you know, I'm in a ramen restaurant in Chinatown and there's a huge giant Iron Man suit. I think from like the second Avengers or something, it looked like it was that style of suit from that movie. So we did that. We had a nice uh, visit, Eric and I. We hadn't seen each other since Origins. And we just kind of cruised around a little bit. Folks were arriving. And then we got into playing some games. Uh, the hotel situation, it seems to be pretty good there. Our hotel was about a half a block from the convention center. Now, the convention center is actually, it's huge. It's right there kind of in the midst of downtown. There's Chinatown there, and there's kind of the city hall type of district with some of the older buildings mis mismatched with the you know no, more modern buildings. There's, there was like an ice skating ring, kind of a central community area. A lot of restaurants on that side as well. Uh, so there was one, I believe it was the Marriott Hotel that's actually attached to the convention center. But the convention center kind of like, almost like an octopus, it kind of just seeps into the surrounding area of downtown. So there were a lot of hotels like a block away, two blocks away, like ours is about a half a block. Uh, so the hotel situation seemed to be pretty well in order. And so hopefully if they do grow, and I do expect it to grow, 
the room situation should be manageable for at least the next, you know, couple of years, it's set, let's say, if not more. So once folks started to arrive, uh, we played a few games, and I had the great pleasure of being able to teach The Expanse, which I've now played, let's see, four times, and I taught it to a bunch of new folks that hadn't played the game. Let's see, Eric played with us, uh, Rodney from Watch It Played played, say that three times fast, and uh, Jamie from The Secret Cabal played, and they all loved it. Uh, we played a four-player game, obviously, uh, got into the thick of it. Uh, very, very uh, interesting game. I had played the OPA faction, which I had not yet played. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Expanse, you've got different sort of space factions trying to take area control and things like that. I will do a review of this pretty soon because uh, I do enjoy it. Uh, and I, I was the cool thing, then this, this play of it actually kind of uh, cemented it for me. I'd played it a couple times before, but not played the OPA. And kind of your opening moves were, they're a lot different based on the factions that you choose. And I thought that was very, very interesting. So I was able to kind of get after a little bit more of the subtleties in here. Now the game's a little bit dry. Uh, you know, it's just kind of pushing cubes around, getting area control and stuff like that. There's not a lot of fireworks that go off in the game. But the kind of the way that decisions sort of unravel as you sort of choose actions based on this row of cards to do action points or events and stuff like that, uh, really uh, kind of took shape in my mind after uh, this play. So I was very excited to get that play, and everybody else was really uh, into it as well. And then later at the end of the convention, uh, Eric and I played a two-player game, which I hadn't done yet. And that was still fun. Eric actually won but didn't seem to like it as much as me because it was sort of a uh, abrupt ending and a little bit lucky for him to win because the way that the scoring card flopped out just you know he already had the advantage to play an event as it was being scored and that just swung the game completely in his favor uh, i thought that was okay because it was a real tight neck and neck game and there was some good kind of push and pull and then yeah the end of the game was a little bit random but you know we both played i think equally well so what are you going to do <laughs> so after a little bit of socializing uh, we broke out uh, Drop Mix, which Matt from Board Game Replay had brought. Now, Drop Mix is a very interesting game. You like hook up an iPad or an iPhone to it, and it has an app, and it has this like music mixer thing, and it has these little cards with these RFID chips in them. And you play these cards, and it kind of changes the music. And there's a couple of different game modes that you can play. Now, we played a couple of different modes, and the one that I liked, uh, the other modes were not good at all, really, in my opinion. Uh, was a co-op mode and it kind of reminded me of playing that one game called the game it's like a little card game where you sort of play cards just on top of each other this one was kind of like that but probably much lighter uh, so you kind of play cards and try to get it rid of them and then you kind of sc try to score bonus points but all the while that you're playing these cards you're mixing up these beats and these different tracks from a lot of different pop songs and rock and roll songs and all that stuff uh, through the last few decades and yeah, you're just kind of playing it, trying to get score points and, and play things. And there's a little button that you hit to sort of like mix up the song and change the tempo and everything. And you have to hit that at certain points and it's all timed. Now, without the music part of it, the game is frankly dumb. There's no way that I would play this game if it didn't have all the music. But the music keeps you kind of just interested enough. It kind of works on that other part of your brain to, you know, keep you kind of rocking and bopping your head and all that stuff. And then meanwhile, trying to play the right cards and communicate and say, I've got this card and I've got the yellow card and I've got the volume two card and all these different little icons and things that are on the cards. You're trying to play everything in, in a most efficient order, but then you're changing the music and that's really cool. Now there's also like a free mix mode where you can just play cards and mess with it. And that's also kind of neat. But from a game perspective, I don't know. The co-op thing was fun. I would totally play that. Now we were playing in the hotel and it was pretty loud. Uh, so I could kind of barely hear the music, and so, but I still had fun. So I think if we were playing like at somebody's house or something and having like a little bit of a party kind of atmosphere, you could like hook this, Matt had this idea, you could hook the drop mix to the stereo or something in the house and kind of just play that and just kind of have that going as sort of ambient background music. I mean, that, that might be kind of a fun thing, you know, people are playing drop mix and other people are playing, you know, no thanks or whatever other games and stuff like that or just hanging out talking. That was actually kind of an interesting idea. So after drop mix, it was getting late. I think most everybody headed to bed. Uh, and then Eric and I broke out a game of Tokyo Highway, which is, holy cow, this game is something else. So you have, it's like a abstract three-dimensional measurement game, really, at its core. And basically what it is, is you're building these highways with these little planks and posts and cars, and you're trying to 
get rid of all your cars. And you do that by building ramps up or down and you go up one level, down one level. But if you go under all of the sort of freeways of your opponent or you're, or you're the one on top, then you can place uh, one or more cars out depending on how many uh, freeways that you cover or go under. And you can only go over each one once. So you can't like crisscross and go back and forth over the same one. And, but if you knock anything over, when you do that, depending on the number of pieces that you knock over, you have to give these construction materials, uh, these little posts, to your opponent, and they, they get extra materials to play with. So the other thing that can happen is that you can lose if you've run out of those uh, tokens. But man, so at the beginning, it's, it's pretty easy, but then you get kind of a mesh network of things, and it becomes much easier to knock stuff over. But then you got to put everything kind of back together. And so the way we were playing it, Eric taught me the rules. So I'll, I'll double check the rules before I do the review. But so when you knock it over, okay, then let's say I knock three pieces over. Okay, I give you my three tokens. And then I'm going to put stuff back together. And so in the process of putting stuff back together, you might knock more stuff over, especially if you're, if you're a klutz like me. So we just played, well, once you knock stuff over, then that's it. And then you kind of work together to put everything back to the same place. But it can be definitely frustrating uh, towards the end once you have a large sort of, you know, network of freeways set up uh, to put everything back together. And so I could see it getting to the point where somebody just gets so frustrated that they concede because they knock so much stuff over. So that's probably an aspect of it. But I did really enjoy the game. And it was certainly one that I was better at by the end of the game than I was at the beginning of the game. So I think if you can kind of get past that initial frustration and being very delicate about how you put things down, they even give you tweezers to place cars down. And Eric actually used the tweezers to pick up a freeway that had dropped down in the middle of all the other freeways. And he was able to get it out and then set it back on the posts, which were, I mean, I don't know how he did it without knocking everything down, but you can get better at that and get through that. So that would be pretty cool. I know there's an expansion to add some more components and some more colors that is not available anywhere. Now you can find this at bgg.com and that's where I got it from, but I, I recommend it. And definitely with the forewarning of that, you might get frustrated and want to throw your hands up in the air, but it was really, really fun a game, especially at like uh, midnight or whatever it was that we were playing it. So that's Thursday. That's kind of the pre-con day. Uh, we all got up early on Friday, the first official day of the con. Now they did let media folks in an hour early to get in and kind of check everything out. One interesting part of that, and I'll just kind of go into the vendor experience now, is that when we came in there, there was no carpet on the convention floor. And it was a little bit chilly. It was, let's see, nine o'clock in the morning in Philadelphia in November. So it was chilly outside and uh, there was no carpet. So it was very cold and we were all kind of commenting about it. And the publishers, most of them were griping about it because you know they kind of thought it would be nice to have the carpet and all that stuff. And they, they did mention a couple of them to me that they didn't get any tables and chairs. They had to bring their own. Some of them didn't know that. Some of them had been to like PAX East where that was provided, but not here. So I don't know that that's a PAX thing or more, maybe more of a Philly convention center thing. Uh, so there was a little bit of griping there. But then as the attendees started coming in at 10 o'clock and especially on Saturday, the one thing I noticed about the lack of carpet is that it did not get very hot in there. Now, I think that's partly due to the fact that it was Philadelphia in November, so it was already kind of cool outside. But I thought maybe that was a good idea because Gen Con, in the middle of August, of course, uh, you know, with carpet, they do run the AC, usually. <laughs> there was a year I went that they didn't run the AC that much, but that gets very hot and muggy and sticky and gross. That, I didn't feel like that happened at all. And this convention was very full, especially on Saturday. Saturday was a zoo, but it kept it cool in there. So I don't know if that was just, you know, you don't get a carpet here or something at the Philly Center or what, or if it was on purpose. But I thought maybe unintentionally that was a good idea because even once on Thursday morning, everybody started coming in. I didn't notice the coolness anymore. Once it was full of people, then it was nice. It was very pleasant to be in the convention center. So prior to everybody getting in there, I was I was chilly. Uh, you know, I was borderline uncomfortably cold. I wouldn't have wanted to hang out in there all day if that was going to be the temperature. Um, but that was very interesting. And I thought the bit about the vendors, uh, you know, not getting tables and chairs was interesting as well. But I think there was a couple of like kind of first year growing pains, and that was probably one of the 
uh, more vocalized to me. Uh, now we wandered around and I just took a look at uh, some different games that folks had. I did get a chance to demo a game from Calliope Games. Uh, it's an Eric Lang design and it's a tile drafting game that's called Ancestry. So it's like Ancestry, but spelled T-R-E-E. -E. So it's Ancestry. And you build physically your tree, your family tree. And you get these different colored tiles and there's male and female and there's uh, different sort of uh, like leaves and hearts and things that you kind of connect with it. You'll see pictures on the YouTube. It's actually a really fun little game. And if I had to be succinct about it, it's basically the uh, military aspect of Seven Wonders where you're just looking at the player to your left and right and seeing if you have more of a certain like kind of diversity of, I guess the word is heritage. I don't know what words they use in the rule book. But like if I have more yellow in more generations than you do, then I get a little victory point token. And those goes up over the round. So in the first round, I'll just get a one point token. In the second round, if I have more than you, I'll get a two point token. And then finally in the third round, you get three points. And then you're going to count up the number of marriages. So you're going to kind of connect hearts. And then you also, some of the different uh, characters that you put into your family tree will generate a certain amount of money round over round. And those are going to give you points. So it's a very, very light drafting game, but it actually works very well. And it's kind of one of those where it's just enough decisions to kind of keep you going. But this is certainly a family game, no pun intended. And, well, no, I take it back. I lied. The pun was intended. <laughs> uh, it's certainly a family game you can play a half hour or so, a good filler game on a game night, that kind of stuff. Uh, nice components, nice art, uh, some nice uh, diversity of folks in there in terms of how you can work the marriages and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that was really cool. I really uh, um, hope this game does well for them. Uh, it's just I like you know you know me. I like those good family games that you can get a good lunchtime game that will keep you engaged, but also not heavy enough that you're quiet at the table. So take a look at that ancestry when it comes out. But other than that, I wandered around. There wasn't a lot of very new releases. Uh, I'll talk about a couple that I I played. And now that was just in the vendor area. Now there's also a first look area, which was amazing. So what they did is they partnered with gamesurplus.com and a couple of folks that worked with them, one of my roommates, Jeff Gamble, he used to do the Longview podcast. He went over uh, with the folks from Game Surplus and I think some other folks, I'm not sure about this, but I think some other folks from PAX went over and collectively they got together and they got a lot of the Essen releases and they set up kind of like a hot games area. They called it the first look area. And they had a lot of these folks called enforcers, which are just volunteers uh, that worked at PAX. And the enforcers did a lot of things. But one of the things that some of them did was teach uh, these new games. So I saw like the Clans of Caledonia table, the Gaia Project table. All that stuff was constantly full. And, uh, and over the course of, uh, you know, especially Saturday and even into late Sunday, that place was packed right up until the end. That, that little area was packed. And I thought that was a great thing. Now, they didn't have multiple copies of stuff, but I mean, I usually could find something that I wanted to play when I was in there. Maybe not the one game that I wanted to do, but I usually found something I was semi interested in and just by randomly, you know, showing up there. You know, I would get a text or something, hey, we're over here playing this. Let's do it. Okay, boom, I'm over there. There's something to play. Uh, so that worked pretty well. Uh, Saturday was kind of the iffy day with that because everything was kind of full on Saturday. It was, it was a zoo on Saturday, but that was cool. So, but in the general vendor area, there wasn't a whole lot of like brand new releases. But I did talk to several publishers, um, several I mean probably more than five, <laughs> that said they thought it was an interesting time of year for a board game convention like this. And there's there was definitely some rumblings of trying to make this an Essen-like convention for the United States, where we've got all the Essen releases that have come out, uh, if they can kind of work it and build up the hype enough that people here can then come here and not only, you know, get a chance to try the Essen games, but maybe even buy them. And that's sort of contradicted, though, I think by maybe the attendees. And it seemed like the vast, vast majority of attendees, this was their first time at any kind of game convention, except for maybe like a very small local one. Some of them had been to PAX East uh, because that's that was that's in Boston. So we were getting a lot of folks that were new to the gaming hobby, new to conventions, 
you know, from all over the Northeast, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, you know, the rest of Pennsylvania, all that stuff. So there's a ton of new people. And I think that's going to be very interesting because I was talking to one publisher and I'm not going to name names because I don't want to like pin people into quotes that we were just casually talking about. But he's he had a very interesting point where he said that, uh, you know, they're going to go home. They're going to play my games. And he was a he's the publisher of heavier games. And he said uh, and he was able to, you know, to move some product. And he said, they're going to go home. They're going to play these games. They're going to play other games. They're going to build in another year of kind of being into gaming and board games and all that fun stuff. They're going to come back next year. They're going to look for these publishers that they ran into, that, that greeted them, you know, were friendly and sold them good games. And they're going to be looking for that next game. And so this could evolve, I think, over the course of, you know, I don't know how many years, but it could get to the point where, okay, hey, all these games came out at Essen. Cool. We're going to go pick those up at PAX Unplugged and try those, especially for folks that are local to the Northeast. So I saw a lot of potential there in terms of how the convention itself can grow and what kind of identity it might take on. So that was very, very interesting. Now, also to kind of counterbalance that, one thing that was interesting is that sales were definitely down. Now, the number of attendees, I haven't seen an official announcement, was about 23,000. And I'm that's just a number I keep hearing. So I don't know the exact number, but that's more than Origins, not anywhere near Gen Con, but definitely more than Origins was this year. But this, they were all saying the sales were down from Origins. So we had more people, but less sales. But they also noticed a pattern of, and it seemed to be pretty much across the board, where a lot of people would come and demo games uh, in the morning and the early afternoon, and then come and spike up sales at the end of the day or in future days. Somebody that maybe demoed a game on Friday would come back on Sunday, try to pick it up, maybe try to get a little bit of a deal on it. So it seemed like uh, a lot of people were just kind of assessing games, checking them out, and you know, just kind of getting into the hobby more and just frankly taking it all in and investigating, evaluating games, deciding which ones they're gonna buy and all that stuff. So that was very interesting. So even though sales seem to be down, uh, the attitude I would say of the various publishers kind of varied, but it kind of weighted mostly on the positive side. Some were very positive. They're saying, yeah, sales were down, but we did like a hundred demos today. And you know, we got some sales, we got a sales spike. We had to drop prices on this product. We don't normally have to drop it. And then that moved some, some boxes out. And other ones were like, yeah, I'm not sure I'm gonna come back next year. So it was a little bit of a mix, but mostly on the positive side. And I think there's a potential there. I think there certainly is a vast potential. I mean, you've got to, I think folks have to follow up on it. Publishers are going to have to follow up on it. The convention itself is going to have to follow up and double down on some of these things that I think were successes. And there's definitely, of course, people more knowledgeable, more in tune with the data than myself. But I certainly think there's potential here to grow this into something uh, special and something that is to be uh, you know, a, a must attend or, you know, you, sh you should probably attend it if you're a publisher kind of thing. So that, that should be interesting to see. Uh, so a couple other games that I played or looked at, I should say. One thing I saw that I didn't know was coming out was the Sentinels of the Universe uh, starter kit for their RPG, Sentinel Comics role-playing game. And I tried to track down uh, the owner, Christopher Bedell, but we kept missing each other. I was trying to get a little bit more in-depth of a presentation about it. I did get some pictures and uh, of the packaging and stuff, and I did get a brief overview of kind of how it's presented. It's pretty cool. It's like a little DM screen that's folded up and you unfold it and you've got little sort of comic book looking rule books. Uh, now the insides aren't very comic booky. I mean, they're like a normal rule book, but you've got like little books for each of the different characters you can play. You can go on different adventures and then that sort of overall casing sort of unfolds into a DM screen. Now, I did do a preview a couple years ago from Gen Con. I think the game's changed probably a fair amount. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to link it because I'm not sure it's accurate anymore. But it does look really cool. And they were demoing it all conventions. So that was something that I didn't expect to see. And I think that's actually coming out pretty soon. So that was good to see. A couple other kind of weird random things that weren't necessarily games. But uh, I did take a look at finally the Gloomhaven insert from Broken Token. Uh, it's 80 bucks, so it's expensive, but man, I wanted to get it because I love Gloomhaven. I've got it kind of tucked away in the closet now because it kind of taunts me because, you know, it's like, you're going to play me only for six months. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Get out of my sight. 
Um, but I, I've got it kind of laying around for one day when I do go through the whole campaign. But man, if you have this uh, game, I would say getting that insert is almost a must because it's ingenious how they organize everything. I mean, it's not just an insert. It comes with little tuck boxes for the different monsters and characters and creatures so that you can easily get stuff out and break it out through the different scenarios. Just, I mean, it's stunning. I think it's certainly worth the 80 bucks, but 80 bucks is a lot for an insert. Um, but if you're on the YouTube, you'll see some of the different pictures of the stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, the next thing I saw in the miniature area was this thing called Tinker Turf. And they're going to be doing a Kickstarter soon. I didn't get prices or dates, but I did get some pictures of it. And if you think about this, it looks like your kind of traditional MDF wooden terrain for games like Necromunda and stuff. Uh, but it's all cardboard. So it's all cardboard punch outs that you then, I assume, glue together, or at least stick together. And it, it's all like pre, you know, not pre-painted, but there's designs on the cardboard. And it's really thick and sturdy. Uh, definitely can hold up a bunch of miniatures standing on it and will definitely take some abuse. Uh, it was, I wouldn't say abuse. It would take some use for sure. So I'll throw some pictures on the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, but in the next maybe month or so, it should be coming out pretty soon, maybe after the first of the year. They're thinking about doing it after Christmas is all gone. Uh, look at Tinker Turf, and uh, and uh, it, it looks like a really cool idea. So depending on the price and all that stuff, maybe it's a way to do kind of affordable, uh, you know, pre-colored, pre-designed terrain for something like a Necromunda or Shadow War or that kind of thing. Seemed like a really cool idea because the cardboard was very, very thick. It looked really cool. It seems like that might be an untapped market for affordable terrain if you just want to open it, throw it on the table, stick it all together, don't have to paint it or glue it or anything. Which leads me into what it ate up most of my Saturday, and that was playing a Warhammer 40,000 game with Matt Evans from Board Game Replay. He brought 1,500 points of his Death Guard, and I brought 1,500 points of my Death Watch, and we played through it, and I think this was his first game at this level. I'd played some 2,000-point games myself, and it was fun. Uh, we had a, a fellow there who just kind of happened by, and he kind of helped us out. Uh, he told me a rule I was playing wrong, and then he caught us when we forgot another rule that you have to shoot a character only if it's the closest thing to you, uh, which was good because... Uh, I, he caught me from te cheating, basically, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but he was very friendly and kind of knowledgeable about the universe and the game and stuff. So it was just fun to have him around. I don't remember his name. I wish I did. But he was he was a cool fellow to have around. Uh, but Matt and I had a great game. It went six rounds. It went almost four hours. I mean, there was certainly some learning and stuff. Uh, the longest game of 40K that I've played, all my games have finished in no more than three hours. Um, but it was fun. It was an epic game. I think I beat him by, like, two points. It was neck and neck the whole way. Uh, he got some of my big units down. I got some of his his big units out of the way. It was really, really fun. Lots of nail biters. And I had a great time playing with him. And uh, the miniatures area in general was really cool. And obviously that's something I've started to kind of look at. And that was kind of the one thing that struck me is the miniature area was right next to that first look area. So in like just a space of a couple of meters, you had a bunch of folks playing Essen games, and then right next to them, you had a bunch of folks playing Warhammer 40,000 and Frostgrave and Age of Sigmar and War Machine and Necromunda and all that stuff. I was like, this is great. This is, my brain is at peace <laughs> because I can move over here and I can play Azul for a little bit or whatever, some Euro game, and then I can shift over and just play like the most trashiest of trashiest Ameritrash game just having those two things next to each other, the hotness, you know, next thing coming out of the European market next to Warhammer. I was like, yes, this is perfect. Now, the miniatures area was fairly quiet on Friday and Sunday. Not a whole lot of activity. So that was nice because, you know, that was one thing I was worried about a little bit because you can't get tickets for things or sign up for things at PAX. Everything is based on this queuing system where you get in line. If it's first come, first serve. If you want to get a miniatures table, you just show up early, get the table. And that's okay, but I was a little bit worried that Matt and I would have brought our miniatures and packed them for me on a plane and then shown up and it was super busy and we couldn't get a miniatures table. So that was a little bit worrisome. But thankfully, you know, that wasn't a problem. If we had tried to schedule on a Saturday, it might have been a problem because... I didn't see really any empty miniatures tables. Now, there were some tournaments and stuff going on, uh, so that was part of that. 
but that's the one thing that I'm a little bit leery about with the way that PAX does it. Let's say that you wanted to attend some event or something and it's full and you were really hoping to do that, but you showed up maybe 15 minutes too late and that last spot in the line was gone. And I don't know. I, I don't. I guess that's fine because you could easily not sign up for it, you know, months in advance when the quote unquote tickets would go on sale or go up for uh, order, even if they're free. So I don't know. That's the one thing I don't like about it. I, I think I'd rather know that nothing's going to be available than show up and hope that it's available, waste my time standing in line when I could have been maybe over here playing a game or going to another event. But I think that's how all the PAXs do it. So that's that's an issue. Now I will say, we'll kind of move into Saturday now. Uh, there was no early entry for, well, apparently there was early entry for media, but not all the folks at the door uh, were told that. But it's actually kind of fine because a bunch of us that got there just got in line with everybody else. And that sort of queuing system and the way they did that works really well because the whole time we were moving, it never stopped. It was a huge line. Saturday was a zoo. And we're just, what was constantly moving, kind of worming its way around. There were, uh, you know, the enforcers were out there keeping everybody in line, making jokes, being friendly, you know, being uh, flamboyant and all that stuff. And that was really fun. And we just had a chance to chat with people in line and with each other. So that, that part of the queuing system kind of worked out. So I thought that was pretty cool. But generally, that queuing thing, I think that still kind of bothers me. Uh, just a couple other games that I played on Friday. I did get a chance to play uh, Merlin, which is a new Stefan Feld game from Queen. Now, we just played what I think is the basic game, although I don't think it's couched as such in the rule book. So eh, I'm not going to explain all the mechanics, but it's a Feld, <laughs> and it's kind of a dice mitigating Feld game kind of thing with a like a rondel sort of thing. I don't know. I'm not going to get into it. But we played a thing where you get these cards, and then you can get sort of bonuses and play the cards for points. Now there's another module that instead of playing those cards for points, you play them to unlock special abilities. And I really want to play it that way. Now I had a great time playing it the way where you just score the cards for points. Everything else in the game is the same, I think. But I really want to try it with those special abilities. I feel like that'd be a much richer, meatier game. So that was a really cool uh, opportunity to play it. And Jamie actually from Secret Cabal picked that up and I think he played it a handful of times over the weekend and everybody seemed to really be enjoying it. Uh, so I'm gonna try to track that one down and try to get uh, some more plays in it at least, especially with that extra mode to see how really good it is. Right now I would kind of couch it as sort of a, a top second tier Feld. It didn't seem to quite get up there with Burgundy or Trajan or Bora Bora, uh, but it's certainly a good game. And uh, But I'd like to see that special power thing because I think that would maybe kick it up a notch and I might place it above you know, kind of his second tier game. And a couple other games we played, Don't Mess With Cthulhu, which is a funky game. This is kind of an interesting game. It's sort of a werewolf resistance style game that you kind of play over the long haul. I, they're gonna do a retheme of this, I believe is like Sherlock Holmes or something. This is from Indie Boards and Cards. When that does come out, uh, take a look at it. It's a little bit of a different vibe. It's, it does this weird thing where you like put cards in front of people and you're going to shuffle them up every couple of rounds of play and you sort of reveal them as you go on. So the investigators are trying to reveal uh, these elder signs and then the Cthulhu players, the cultists, are trying to reveal uh, the Cthulhu card. But after so many kind of reveals of the card, you take them and shuffle them up and mix them all around. So it's very much one of those long con social deduction games where you have to really kind of gauge and sort of stage your lies <laughs> over the course of a couple of rounds to kind of get people in. And it's got kind of the reverse double thing happening in a relatively obvious way. I don't want to, that sounds negative, but it's very much in your face, but it plays very quick. So that's certainly one I'll be looking forward to playing more of. Uh, and then we played a couple of games of Shadespire uh, this night and a couple of other times. And I got a chance to finally play with the Skeletons and the Oryx, which are the two new expansions. Those experiences kind of went off funky because I just threw together the cards randomly. I didn't spend any time trying to deck build. So they were very wonky, different games. And that's one thing that struck me about uh, playing even those games and even some games with the factions that come in the box is these games can really play out differently. And you really kind of have to know uh, the metagame a lot. Uh, but I thought that was cool. I liked that because there were certain things that you could do to sort of 
almost guess at uh, negating some of your opponent's objectives and stuff like that. Anyway, I've done a playthrough and things like that in a review of Shadespire, but still it continues to impress. And then I think before we move into Saturday, I just wanted to talk about some of the other things that were going on at the convention. You know, they had a lot of panels and stuff like that, just kind of your typical sort of uh, topics that you see at a lot of game conventions. Uh, there was an Unpub event, and if you're not familiar with Unpub, it's a place for kind of up-and-coming designers to bring their unpublished prototypes. And basically, it's just a giant room of all those folks, and they kind of play test each other's games and give feedback and sort of share the wealth in terms of the play testing and stuff like that. So I was very happy to see them uh, go there. There's a lot of good folks involved with that uh, that movement, so to speak. There's Unpub will show up at Gen Con and Origins and even its own little events and stuff like that. So that's that's that was good to see. One thing that was that was neat was they did kind of these learn to play sessions. And I know Rodney Smith from Watch It Played uh, participated in a few of these and Marty Cannell, I think helped them out. Uh, even Eric from Push Your Luck Podcast helped out a little bit. And I think uh, Quince from uh, Shut Up and Sit Down helped out and some other folks where you kind of fill up a room of 50 people and teach a game to all of them at once. That was a really cool kind of thing. And from the little bit of feedback I got about that, it seemed to actually work uh, pretty well. It kind of depended on the game and the player count and stuff about how you know well or not well that it worked out. But I thought that was an interesting kind of approach to a panel and as sort of a board game quote unquote media person that interested me because I thought that's a good way to sort of interact with uh, viewership of one's channel because it's kind of like what you do you you teach people games you educate them and give them your opinions on the games and so you can just kind of communicate that and kind of share that experience of learning to game together and getting your first couple of turns and first few plays in so I thought that was a really cool way uh, as a media person to sort of just interact with folks that watch your channel or whatever it might be. That was a really neat idea. Uh, let's see, not much else really to say. A couple more games that I did get a chance to play. I got a chance to play Transatlantic. This is a new Matt Gertz game. He designed Navigador and Concordia and Imperial and all those games like that. I really enjoyed this game. Now there is a couple of weird issues with the rule book and there's a weird color misprint on one of the cards, or a bunch of the cards I should say. Um, but I was playing with somebody that had played before and kind of worked through those little rule snafus. I really like this game. It kind of took parts of the Concordia card system where you play cards and play cards and so you play a card that allows you to pick up all your cards so you can play them more and kind of the sort of, I don't know if it's engine building, but sort of exponential point building contract idea from Navigador and then a system of sort of investing in new and new ship technologies. So you start with sailboats, basically, and then work into the steamships and so on and kind of work through the century and upgrade your shipping capacity and your capabilities and all that stuff. Uh, really interesting. I definitely think I like it more than Concordia uh, because the one thing it has that Concordia doesn't, or actually that's sort of an oxymoron, the one thing Concordia has that I don't like that this doesn't have is that weird wonky end of game scoring where you had to like keep track of four other players hidden scoring all built into their decks which i is kind of just always kind of bugged me this doesn't have that the end game scoring in this is is very intentional it's very approachable and you can manipulate it and you can deal with it and the way that the ships kind of change how they're valued and why excuse me why they're important it's very interesting over the course of the game because you're kind of trying to like burning through them in the game and kind of allowing them to sort of uh take a value and take shape and and change over the course of the game and then once the kind of the end game starts to approach then you start to look at them in different ways and you try to have a little bit of almost like an area control of certain types of ships uh, at the very end of the game. So that's really, really cool. And the way the cards work and and the interactions between, you know, when people play cards and you can play cards to copy other people's cards and you can get new and sort of draft special ability cards and that'll kind of uh, help your strategy in certain ways. Really interesting. Very dry and abstract in a lot of ways, but I thought it was very, very fun. Let's see, next couple of games. Uh, Majesty, this is from Z-Man Games. I'd not heard of this. We played this again in the the first look area it's almost like you mash together splendor and um, century spice road it had a lot of elements kind of from both of those games 
and very quick, simple, uh, 30 minute kind of little engine building game. It had a little bit more player interaction than either of those games. And I thought that was a neat uh, breath of fresh air. And it has a couple of different game modes that you can do, but you basically take these cards and you sort of activate different abilities. They have like eight different sort of buildings and then you're just drafting workers and putting them in the building that matches them. But when you put that worker in the building, then it triggers uh, like a payout of points. So you, if you put a mill worker to get some wheat for you, you put it in there and you get two points per mill worker that's there. So if I take a second one, I'll be getting four points total. And then you have the brewmaster, which will give you some money, plus some money based on how many mill workers you have. And you have all these kind of different interactions that get slightly more complex as you kind of head down the line. But you can also draft like uh, army fellas that will attack others and then they'll have folks send different characters to their infirmary, which then they have to actually use the witch to heal them and give them a drink, a healing potion. Uh, but it actually works out really well because you're actually putting out these little meeples to buy the cards from this row. And then as other people take cards from the row, they'll get those meeples back and there's a way to generate extra meeples which get you extra points. Very, very dirt simple, very unassuming, but it's actually, I think, really, really good. And we were just played with kind of the basic side. If you take a look at like kind of the B sides of the cards, it looks like it may even be even more interesting. So that was a nice little surprise. Uh, I did get a chance to demo Catan VR. So I went to a hotel room, put on an Oculus Rift, and hooked myself up to a laptop. If you're on YouTube, you can see some funny pictures of me and played through a game of Catan. And inside this virtual reality, I basically was in this kind of medieval kind of cabin playing these characters and using my hands and everything to manipulate the Catan board and manipulate my hand of cards. It was a very, very well polished and I think well executed uh, version of the game. They said it was still kind of borderline alpha beta and that they'll have a, you know a little bit more usable of a piece of software here in the next month or two. Uh, but I thought from what was there, they were certainly on the right track. Now, personally, doing VR board games, eh, not so much interest at all, really none. But he did mention some interesting applications for this uh, if you wanted to play um, you know, online and feel more like you're at a game table, uh, be able to verbally and more visually communicate with the folks you're playing with. I was like, okay, that's a little bit interesting because I could sit and play games with a bunch of folks that I know that live on the East Coast, for example. And, you know, we could all strap on our Oculus Rifts and play Catan and see each other and sit at the table and have a little bit of that more social interaction, the facial gestures and all that kind of stuff, and be able to speak to each other. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting, but okay, I have a game group here locally, so that's fine. Uh, but then he also mentioned they'll support f uh, certain uh, uh, devices for uh, handicapped folks that will like use their tongue to click. So if you think of like a paraplegic or someone with ALS, uh, they could put this thing on and the inputs will respond to that. So in that way, that would give them an opportunity to play a board game uh, without maybe the need for a, a third party assist, assistance. And I've seen that before with folks, you know, they have kind of a, a buddy with them uh, that helps them move pieces around and actually physically interact with the board game while they were sort of making the decisions. And this is pretty cool because they could actually be a little bit more kind of in touch, so to speak, with the game itself. I was like, okay, that sounds pretty awesome. So if this is something that we can see, you know, get some kind of foothold, I think that would be, man, amazing for people that don't have, you know, working arms and and, and hands and everything. And, and uh, so right there, I was like, okay, I hope this does well. Uh, so that was cool. And then I think my game of the show was Hunt for the Ring. Uh, this really, well, I say that a lot. It surprised me. It didn't surprise me. I expected it to be good, but I think it surprised me how much I, I loved it. And I'm going to say a tentatively hyperbolic thing and say I think this has replaced Fury of Dracula for me. Now, I've only played it once, and I've only played uh, one side of it because it's actually a double-sided board. So what this game is, is one player is Frodo and uh, the rest of the Hobbits, and they are trying to get the ring from at least in the first game, from the Shire all the way to Bree. And so they're trying to avoid the Nazgul from getting caught. And then on the other side of the board, you're going from Bree 
to Rivendell where the elves live. And so it's a hidden movement deduction game. One player is trying to escape the group of four other players. And now if you only have two players, one player can take control of all four Nazgul. Now when you play on the second side, you'll splash in uh, Gandalf and Aragorn. And then also the, I can't remember his name, but like, he's like the Night King, the head white, the head witch. And so it's a whole other game with like some little twists on the mechanics. But what this basically does is take the War of the Ring card play and dice systems and then mashes them with kind of a hidden movement, Fear of Dracula, Scotland Yard style of game. It works really, really well because you have some of those double action cards where you're like, okay, if I play this now, it's going to allow me to maybe put a token out here, which will block the Nazgul from moving down this path or I'll put it in a way that they think I need to block them. And meanwhile, I'm on the other side of the board and they go to this, you know, ally token that is co as a complete distraction, or I can save this card for later. And based on where you're at in the board, the card will maybe will do different effects. So you're like, okay, if I do this now, it's good. But if I can get through kind of by the seat of my pants to this next position, I'm going to hammer him with this card. And there's a little bit of kind of a uh, currency that the fellowship player the hobbits have where you have to be very choosy about uh, these uh, tokens that you can use to activate the cards. so some cards you can just play some cards you have to spend these fellowship tokens and those are the really good effects but once you spend them uh, it's kind of hard to get them back especially if you've activated frodo's special ability to kind of give you a second double movement once you do that you flip him down and then he's no longer generating those tokens every turn and all of the hobbits have this they have a little bit of a buff so it's allowing you to draw extra cards and things like that. But then if you get in a pinch, you can activate them. And then, but then you, you know, to do some special ability, but then you don't have your little uh, ability running on all times. And then the Nazgul players, they all roll dice and they get different abilities. This is just like a War of the Ring where they activate dice for different abilities. Um, you know, you got wilds and things like that. Uh, and they have sorcery cards and similar kind of dual purpose kind of actions there. But man, the way that the sort of action allowance versus the hidden movement deduction stuff, that really kept me engaged and kept everybody engaged through the course of the game. And there were some points where they were really discussing, because uh, the discussion of the Nazgul players has to all happen in the open so that the Fellowship player can hear it. So they were discussing, okay, we're going to use this dice now, and you could do that and do this. I've got this card. They have to describe the card out loud. They can't just show it to somebody. They, they make they can be kind of obtuse because like, I have a card that will help us here but anything they say has to be out loud in front of me and so they're like oh we're really sorry that we're discussing this and I'm like no no, no. <laughs> keep talking because I mean the whole time I'm thinking okay they're trying to do this okay it's probably better if I do this and that so it's keeping me engaged even though my turn isn't happening right this minute uh, really interesting things lots of cool little thematic things like the Nazgul can go sort of like interrogate people in some of these different key locations. If they can find some that are chosen randomly at the beginning of the game and they find the right ones, then they start to unlock special abilities that they can do with their dice. So the dice take on kind of a second nature based on that. And it gives them something to do as we kind of inevitably get closer to each other. So that's cool. So there's a lot of sort of push and pull kind of dynamics and, and a lot of good kind of decisions baked into a lot of parts of the game. And I've, it has even even that part of it where I talk about you know them going in and getting trying to get clues and building up their dice capabilities. That's actually kind of tailored to the difficulty of the game. If you find out that somebody's really good at Frodo and escaping, or uh, the Nazgul players are really winning all the time, then you can kind of scale how those special abilities are initiated to start the game. And I thought that's really cool because a lot of times with these kind of games, you can get somebody that's like really good at playing Dracula or really good at playing Frodo and you want to make it a little bit more difficult for them. Uh, so then you just give a, the Nazgul kind of a couple of notches down on that ability track to kind of get them off their feet a little bit more earlier in the game. And the last thing that really kind of brings this home for me is it's not just about the Nazgul finding Frodo or not finding Frodo. Uh, if they find Frodo, they don't just automatically win. You go through this very brief little kind of hunt phase where Frodo has to kind of activate the ring and then escape. Well, that, what that does is corrupts Frodo. And so the Nazgul aren't trying to necessarily just catch Frodo. They're trying to corrupt him. And there's a little corruption track. So it's just like in War of the Ring where you're trying to get him to 12 corruption. 
And then Frodo's trying, he has 16 moves to get from one side of the board to the other. And even if you don't make it, let's say you get two away and you used up your moves because you backtracked, then you're gonna flip corruption tokens for each space that's left to get you to Bree in this case. And if that you know doesn't push you over the corruption marker, then you still win. Now, based on how you complete that first side of the board, then you go to the second side of the board and then you can play kind of the final part of that game. Or you can just play the first side of the board or the second side of the board. Both You can play both of them and then it'll give you special tokens that you can throw into War of the Ring as kind of like a prequel. I don't know, really cool, uh, great production and all that stuff. Uh, this is definitely one of these that's up there high for my game of the year. This is going to be in my top five or whatever, however I plan on doing that list. Uh, really fun, works well with the theme, uh, lots of great tense moments. You know, you can, you can tell they spent a lot of time kind of refining and getting this design uh, to where it is now. Well, that's pretty much everything from uh, PAX Unplugged. Overall, I had a great time, played a lot of different new games. Met a lot of different new folks, like I said earlier. Lots of brand new folks that are new to conventions, relatively new to gaming. Uh, so that I thought was a great sign. I think it, overall there was a lot of great potential uh, down the road over the next couple of years. I think for a first year convention, even though yes, they've done PAX East and PAX Prime and all that stuff, uh, it went off really well. I thought it did good. It seemed to me there was just a little bit of complaining in terms of from the publishers, in terms of their sales being a little bit lower than expected. And frankly, I don't think they didn't know what to expect. Uh, maybe a little bit of snafus and stuff, but frankly, I hear that at every convention. Uh, the open gaming area was was huge. It was, it was massive. It was much bigger than Origins even. Now it did close at midnight, which is, yeah, I don't know. I'm a weirdo and like the game past midnight, but um, mostly because my body's on the West Coast clock. <laughs> Uh, so I'm usually up at like a Gen Con until like one or two in the morning. That's not a big deal. If it, I wouldn't say that's a deal breaker. Yeah, you're going to get your hardcore people that are going to complain. And they're like, well, if I'm at BG Con, I can play 24 hours a day or Gen Con. I'm like, okay, yeah, <laughs> everybody else is going to go to sleep. Uh, you know, and I'm one of those that would, would game late too. Uh, other than that, I mean, it had a nice miniatures area, the new first look area. A lot of the events seemed like they were a lot of fun. They had an episode of Acquisitions Incorporated, which I didn't get a chance to go to, uh, which I wanted to, but just, you know, you just get busy playing games, and then it's like, well, I can either leave this game or go to this thing. And I'm like, well, I'll stay and play this game because it's going to be a lot more fun because I'll be playing games with my friends. And, uh, yeah, so I think overall it was a success. Uh, it does coincide, or excuse me, it did coincide this year with BGG Con, which is unfortunate because I know a lot of people had to choose and some people chose to go to BGCon and some people chose to go to the new thing. So, um, I don't know. I've seen some weird stuff online. It's frankly bothered me a little bit about people saying like there's some kind of loyalty friggin' crap that, you know, they have to go to BGCon. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard that you would be loyal to a convention that you spend thousand dollars in plane and hotel and stuff to go to. Uh, that's pretty dumb. Uh, anyway, so that has kind of irritated me and that's my only kind of negativity about it. As you know, even though next year it's not going to be the same exact weekend, and I think the next couple of years it's going to be put a strain on publishers and stuff, of course, to attend. Um, yeah, that's rough, but you know, the hobby evolves, right? Doesn't it change over time? And uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if this became like a big old Essen style show with all the new European releases and all that stuff? I think, yeah, that's awesome. I think, does it have the family esque atmosphere in the intimacy of Board Game Geek Con? Absolutely not. Um, and that's something that I think is, uh, you know, I don't think you, I don't think they're trying to go for that. First of all, I don't think they should, um, BG con, I don't know. Should they grow? Should they stay the same size? I don't know. Uh, who cares? Um, they should do what they're going to do and they should do it in such a way that they can sell out and everybody cannot lose their shorts over it and everybody should have fun. And that's all that matters. Um, but yeah, so I think for me, I guess I can speculate a little bit here. I'm probably not going to go to either one next year. I'm uh, probably just going to go to Gen Con because money's tight. Vacation days are tight. I like to spend vacation days going on actual vacation. Uh, we know with my family, I mean. And um, so, yeah, so there's that. Um, so I think I would recommend PAX Unplugged, especially if you're in the Northeast and it's convenient for you. Uh, definitely go take a look at this. There's going to be all kinds of fun stuff to do. Uh, it's going to grow over the next couple of years. It's going to get bigger and better, I expect. 
as long as uh, you know folks stay on the ball. So I highly recommend folks check this out. Uh, to me, if I were to kind of rank conventions, I'd still put Gen Con on the top. Uh, Pax Unplug would be definitely second. Uh, it would be above Origins, I think, uh, because it has the same uh, food situation as Origins, which has the best food situation. But I think this is actually better now. Um, of course, you know, BGG Con and stuff like that, that's kind of its own thing. BGG Con, Dice Tower Con, Geek Way to the West, those are kind of like your medium cons. Those are more your more intimate cons. To me, they're comparing apples to oranges when you do talk about that. Like, I would put Sasquatch over in Seattle, which is like a 150-person invite-only event as my favorite con. But uh, nobody else can go to that. <laughs> and I go there because my friends all go there. Uh, and that's just us playing games from Essen and going and eating at the Whole Foods. You know, like, that's it. But dang, if it isn't the funnest thing that I do. Um, but as far as the big cons go, it's... I think it's going to be nipping at the heels at Gen Con here, maybe in five, six years. So we'll see. That's that. Thanks for listening. And uh, if you don't watch my videos and just listen to this, have a good Christmas and Happy New Year. Thanks. Thanks.